one of the conversations which has really sprung up in a big way in the last year in the anime community that has deeply fascinated me is that of whether or not anime studios really matter. Whether or not looking at anime studios is a good way of finding trends in shows, or if you should really just be looking at the individual people who work on shows as opposed to the studios that they uh, work for at times. Now, I was planning to do a podcast about this with the Canapa Effect, who has been making this point pretty publicly, you know, trying to get people talking about this idea that maybe the studios don't matter that much, as well as Josh Dunham of Wave Motion Canon. And I still might do that podcast, but I thought it might be difficult to make my points there without first being able to show some examples of what I want to talk about with regards to this, and to just make my stance on it completely clear. See, what interests me so much about this conversation is that back in the late 2000s, when anime studios first started to be a thing that, like, everyone was really taking seriously, and people started, like, you know, really connecting their favorite shows with studios, and, and like, having expectations for certain studios, I was a huge part of that. I was very much a guy who like, would, you know, discover a studio that I loved and then watch all their stuff and, like, really start talking about what that studio's style is. And on the one hand, I completely agree that talking about the individual people who work at a studio is every bit, if not more, helpful than talking about the studio itself, because a lot of people who work on anime are freelancers who will work for all kinds of different places, who will bring their personal style to every show they work on, you know, so following one guy's career will definitely yield more similarities between shows than just looking at the works of a studio will. And in the cases of a lot of studios that don't take on tons of freelance workers, there is just a core staff who always works there. I mean, if you're talking about something like Kyoto Animation, most of their shows are made by the same sort of group of people. So even though there are differences between the different shows depending on who was the character designer, who was the director, and things like that, you can still very much tell when you're watching a Kyoto Animation show. Like, you're never gonna turn on one of their shows and wonder what studio it is. You're gonna know immediately that it's a Kyoto Animation show, but that's because it's mostly the same staff. But I really think, and what I want to make the case for here, is that even in cases where it's not the same people working on every show, studios do have an identity, a sort of like mandated way that they are that goes beyond who's working on the shows. And I think that there's there's a lot more credence to this than it seems logical. Like, you would probably think, like, yeah, if a studio is the same people working on every show, then of course they're going to be similar. But even in studios where that's not the case, it's amazing how much consistency there is across different shows, even with almost none of the same people working on them. For instance, let's take a look at a classic example from the late 2000s of something that is a trend solely because of the studio and seemingly not having to do with anybody who worked on it, which is the Rie Kugimiya Sundere phenomenon. So, in the late 2000s, JC Staff did three different light novel adaptations, all of which starred tiny Sundere lolly characters voiced by Rie Kugimiya. That would be Shakugan no Shana, Zero no Sukaima, and Toradora. None of them have the same director, none of them have the same writer, none of them have the same character designer, none of them come from the same source material, none of them have even really the same visual aesthetic, and yet all of them have a lolly tsundere voiced by Rie Kugimiya. So it seems very clear that JC staff were doing this on purpose. They had one successful show that was a light novel adaptation starring a lolly voiced by Rie Kugimiya, and so they made two more. And this is, I mean, it's an unavoidable similarity between the three shows, and they were being compared constantly back then, especially Shana and Tsukaima, because the main characters were so similar in their personalities in those shows. And even though there's so much that's different about those shows, you really had this sense, like, when Toradora came out, it was like, gee, I wonder what studio made this show about a lolly sundere voiced by Rie Kugimiya. Could it be JC Staff? Oh, big surprise it is. 
And the same thing is happening this past year in 2016, but in a different genre, where JC staff put out Flying Witch and Amanchu, which again have none of the same staff, not the same source material, you know, not the same director, not the same character designer, and yet both of them are these extremely slow-paced, low-key, slice-of-life Iyashike shows with really beautiful character designs, um, you know, really attractive um, female-driven casts, and they take place in these sort of backwater, exotic, you know, well, not exotic, but backwater locations in Japan that are very relaxing. These, like, very beautifully drawn locales. They're, like, the exact same kind of show. They have all of the same trappings, and yet none of the same staff, none of the same people working on them, you know, at least none of the same main staff, different directors, different character designers. But they are clearly coming from the same place. JC staff was obviously trying to make the same kind of show between these two shows. JC staff has also become characterized by doing long-running Shonen Jump adaptations with, uh, with this very, like, sort of adult aesthetic where, like, they've taken on, of all the Shonen Jump manga they could have adapted, the ones they've done have been Bakuman and Food Wars, both of which have more, like, standard anime kind of designs. They're not, like, very Shonen, uh, like, you know, Naruto or One Piece, which have, like, extremely distinctive designs. They're shows with more anime style, more, like, uh, attractive women in, like, fan service kind of stuff in a more typical anime fashion, you know? And they're coming out with these shows in 26-episode chunks or 13-episode chunks like a normal anime show would have as opposed to a long-running shonen that goes on forever, you know? They're just taking a very different approach than what other Shonen Jump adaptations are taking, and even though those, those two shows have, you know, little in common in waves of staff, they're following the same ethos. If you look at a studio like Bones, no matter what genre they're doing, what the character designs look like, what the style is, who the director is, you're always going to get amazing fight animation. Even in a show like Akagami no Shiryuki Hime, which by all rights could have gotten by having no fights in it, has amazing fight animation. And, you know, when you get to that moment in the ep in episode one where this, this amazing fight breaks out, you're like... Gee, I wonder if this is Studio Bones, you know, especially because there's also this very vibrant color palette in the show and like just th that combination of expressive animation and really just beautiful design work is so characteristic of Bones. It doesn't even matter that it's different styles in each show. They're always going to go all out with the style. It's just consistent with them, you know? There's very, very few Bones shows that don't have some kind of very expressively distinctive visual style. So it is a Bones thing to do that, you know, regardless of which animators work on it, which staff work on it. And now you've got Bones who's doing, similarly to JC staff, like a sort of formula for how they release their shows, where you've got all these split season shows and second seasons that come later, like where they do Blood Blockade Battlefront, and now that's getting a second season, you know, after 12 episodes, they did uh, the same thing with Boku no Hero Academia, they had the split core on, uh, uh, pff, god damn, I just said the name, Akagami no Shiro Yuki Hime, like, they're releasing all these shows with a certain formula for release, which is we do a 12 episode season, kind of see how it does, and then we'll do another one, or we'll deliberately split it in half across, you know, two parts of the year, and it's just like, that's a thing that Bones is doing. Doing now. Meanwhile, you look at Madhouse, which has historically been a studio that doesn't do second seasons. And the president of Madhouse, Masao Maruyama, um, you know, I saw him at a panel once and he said, like, at Madhouse, we don't like to do a second season of a show unless it's Hajime no Ippo, which we will do forever. Like, that's just outright, it didn't matter who the director was, who was working on the show, what kind of show it is, Madhouse doesn't do a second season. And that's why they have shows like Claymore that wrap up in, like, a weird way that nobody's happy with, because they don't want to do another season of Claymore, you know? They have tons of shows that just have truncated endings or just, just stop and they never made another season of it. Because making a season's not really what they do, with rare exceptions like Hajime no Ippo and Kaiji. And some of it's changing because of the fact that, you know, Maruyama doesn't work for Madhouse anymore. That studio has 
moved on and evolved in a new way. You know, it's it started doing different types of shows that maybe it wouldn't have done as many of back in the day, um, though I still think it's not that inconsistent of a catalog. And, like, there's very few Madhouse shows that don't look like Madhouse shows, you know? And granted, there are some. There are some shows that if you showed me it and you said it was Madhouse, I'd be like, oh... But that doesn't surprise me too much because they have not always had a consistent catalog. But among the shows that do look that way, it's not about who made the shows. It's like they consistently have this way with having, like, really hard lines on character designs. You know, if you look at, like, Claymore and then look at Kashurn Sins, not the same designers, not the same team, but you can tell they're from the same studio. Like, that's just... The, they just have that madhouse look. That sort of gritty, hard-lined feel to them even in their adaptations that come from different directors it's amazing how often madhouse would sort of flesh out the settings of the manga better or flesh it out to look more like a filmic scene like i remember both the opening well really all of cardcaptor sakura in the show like the manga is very flowery and doesn't have much in the way of like setting design whereas the show would like really show you different angles of everywhere so you had this sense of like the space in sakura's house and then I watch Hajime no Ippo and the same thing happens. The manga had no sense of space, whereas the anime starts off with these like these shots that really show you the layout of Ippo's house. And these are different directors, you know, different styles of show, different genres, and yet they both have this characteristic and it continues through a lot of Madhouse's work. And again, it's not to say that every Madhouse show does this, but a lot of them do. And it's not just the same directors or the same staff. Another thing about Madhouse is that they're OP and ED choices. Like, you will consistently get these heavy metal songs that you would not get anywhere else, you know? They keep bringing back, and this is continued with MAPPA, with uh, Masao Maruyama, you know, moving to make his own studio, and somehow both Madhouse still and MAPPA are doing this, of, like, using all these heavy metal bands and songs, like Galnerius and Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, and uh, Kiniku Shoujo Tai, and like, yeah, like, where else are you gonna hear these songs? I have discovered so many of my favorite bands through Madhouse and MAPPA shows, and also through Shaft shows, who Shaft also consistently, no matter who the director is, and I mean, Shaft has a pretty concrete staff, so it's not too surprising they would do this, but no matter who is working on that show, it's gonna have a weird OP or ED. It's either gonna be like an experimental band, or it's going to be uh, an original for the show, possibly done by an experimental band, you know? If you watch a Gonzo or Satellite show, you're gonna see a bunch of CG. If you watch a UFO table show, you're gonna see their, you know, digital processing effects at work. If you watch a trigger show, you're gonna know you're watching a trigger show. It's gonna be pretty fucking obvious because the characters move in a way that no other studio does. No studio animates the way trigger animates. But some of those are obvious cases. Some of those are studios where it's a lot of the same staff working on every show. But even, again, in cases where it's not obvious, there can be so many weird factors. Like, Dogakobo is a studio that has almost exclusively does cute girl shows, but they animate them with just tons and tons of energy. And it's not about just a few, like, you know, this one animator does it. Every show they do has high energy animation in what is a cute girl's slice of life, you know, kind of show. And you wouldn't get that from another cute girl slice of life show. Like if you're watching a cute girl slice of life show and you know, you know, it's not Kyoto animation cause it doesn't look like one of their shows. And then suddenly you see this unbelievably expressive movement. Your thought is going to be, is this Doga Kobo? Because it sure seems like something they would do. And maybe you're not always going to be right. Maybe it's going to be Lerke or however the hell, Lark, however you pronounce their name. But it's certainly not going to be a JC staff show. It's certainly not going to be a uh, a Madhouse show. You're, like, you're going to know it's not one of those because studios have a personality. If you watch a Silverlink show, it's always going to have this very bright and poppy aesthetic. Most of their shows are directed by Shin Onuma, so you're usually going to see a lot of his trademarks. But even when he doesn't direct, every show has this very bright, poppy atmosphere. They usually have very simplistic character designs. Like if you watch Stella no Maho, like and then watch Prisma Ilya or something, like, you can kind of tell 
that these are the same, like, you can, you can easily process that this is the same studio, you know, and you would not suspect that uh, Brains Base did this, like, that would not seem right. And all this brings us to A1 Pictures, because A1 Pictures is the most complicated of them all, and as, you know, Canapa has talked about extensively, there is no, like, core staff of A1 Pictures, it's just a bunch of producers, and they just bring in people from you know, all over the the industry to work on their shows. And sometimes there's consistency between them because they bring in the same directors more than once or they bring in the same designers, this and that. And, uh, you know, Canapa said that if you look at the producers, you can kind of see some consistency on what kind of shows they would they would ask for. But I really have to wonder if there's not, like, mandates beyond that. If maybe... You know, yeah, every show is different, but in some way, they're the same. Because I think, I know Canapa disagrees with me on this, but I think the A1 face, as I've called it, is definitely a thing. And I remember the first time I saw the promotional images for Grimgar of Fantasy and Ash, and I thought, that's Kirito. Like, he just looks like Kirito. He has the same fucking face as Kirito. The same face that Inaho has. The same face that Ayato has, you know? And I was like... They did it again. It's another A1 show. But when you actually watch the show, aside from the faces, it's totally different. The character design styles, not like SAO. The overall look of the show is exactly like other stuff by that director. You know, he's worked with Madhouse. He did the show um, Morio no Hako. And if you look at that show, it looks like a Madhouse show, even though it also looks like his show. And if you look at Nerowere Tagakuen that he did with uh, with Sunrise, like it looks, it you can tell it's the same director because the visual style is so similar to that of Morio no Hako, and yet it doesn't feel like a Madhouse show. Like if you told me it was Madhouse, I would probably be surprised. And if you told me Grimgar was Madhouse, I would definitely be surprised because it looks nothing like a Madhouse show. Even though you can tell by the color design and everything, and by the way that th things animate and stuff, that it's obviously the same director as Morio no Hako and Nerobere Tagakuen. Like his style is very distinct. He also did Ayura. Um, you can immediately recognize this dude's work, and yet somehow. Grimgar still has the A1 face, you know, and maybe that's because of the source material, but maybe that's why A1 picks that source material. Maybe they pick stuff that looks like SAO because SAO is their most successful show of all time. So, you know, even though, yes, it does matter who the new designer is, who the new director is for each show, that doesn't mean that the studio's not, you know, upholding certain things that they sort of see as their identity. If a studio is all about one kind of show or or they they think that they want to continue, you know, making shows that are successful in the same way that their previous one was, then they're going to keep injecting the same elements into each show and, you know, mandate that stuff like, hey, guy who directed, uh, uh, what's it called, that Grimgar, you know, you can do your visual style, that's what we want you for, but... Make sure it also looks enough like SAO that people will think it's more of the same of SAO because that's a really successful show, you know? So, yeah. That's why I think that studios very much do still matter, and they do still have identities, and there still are lots of ways that you can tell a studio's show the second you see it. You know, it's not like every anime is like that. I would say probably 75 to 80% of any new shows. Like, I could watch them and figure out what studio it is within, you know, probably a 5% margin of error just by looking at it. And, you know, a lot of the studios are the ones who have the consistent staff. But even among the ones who don't, if a new show comes out that looks exactly like Flying Witch in a Manchu, I'm going to be pretty fucking suspicious that it's JC staff, you know. Uh... Anyways, yeah, that's my point. Maybe we'll do a podcast on this anyways. Um, I'll see if Canapa or Josh watches this video and how they react before I figure that out. See you next time.